Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for the sixth annual Community Engaged Research Lecture. My name is Pamela Garcia Ramirez, and I'm the Executive Assistant and Events Planner for the Office of the Vice President for Research. Um, just a few announcements before we start, just really quick. Um, we will have a question and answer session once the lecture is done. Please use the Q&A icon at the bottom of your screen. Tabitha Thomas from our office will be moderating that. We have a very limited time for this. If we do not get to your question, please send us an email to ovpr at unm.edu and we will make sure to get those to Dr. Denendale. This event is being recorded and should be made available on our website sometime next week. Now I will turn it over to Dr. Barbara Rodriguez, Senior Vice Provost for Academic Affairs. Welcome and thank you for joining me for the University of New Mexico's sixth Community Engaged Research Lecture and Award Presentation hosted by the UNM Office of the Vice President for Research. My name is Barbara Rodriguez. I am Senior Vice Provost and Professor of Speech and Hearing Sciences. Tonight is an opportunity for the university to demonstrate the high value it places on community engaged research and creative activity, which captures research that engages faculty in academically relevant work that simultaneously meets the UNM mission and vision, as well as community goals and priorities. This award recognizes exceptional scholarly work that embodies UNM's commitment to community engagement and profoundly and systematically affects the relationship between the university and the larger community in a positive and meaningful way. We celebrate the significant achievements of Dr. Jennifer Nez Dennett-Dale, Professor of American Studies. As part of tonight's program, we will get a glimpse of Professor Dennett-Dale's exemplary work and then present her with the university's highest honor for community engaged scholarship. We look forward to her Dene feminist perspective on the COVID-19 pandemic in the Navajo Nation. I would now like to welcome Professor Aloysia Goldstein, Professor of American Studies to introduce our lecture this evening. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Um, so it's a tremendous honor and pleasure to introduce tonight's um, esteemed award recipient and speaker, my friend and colleague, Dr. Jennifer Dennett Dale. My introductory remarks would be far too long where I do include a full list of her remarkable accomplishments and the field defining publications. Nonetheless, I do wanted to offer a few highlights of some of Dr. Dennett Dale's imp uh, impressive contributions. Dr. Dennett Dell is an internationally renowned scholar of critical indigenous studies, indigenous feminisms, gender and sexuality and Navajo studies. She is a citizen of the Navajo nation and from Tohatchi, New Mexico, a professor of American studies at UNM and the director of UNM's Institute for American Indian Research. She received her PhD in history from Northern Arizona University. She exemplifies the very best of what a scholar, community-based activist, teacher, and mentor can be and do. Her highly acclaimed book, Reclaiming Dene History, The Legacies of Chief Navajo Chief Manuelito and Juanita, provides a unique Dene-centered history that incorporates an oral tradition and serves as a vital corrective to conventional narratives of US history. Reclaiming Dene History remains a touchstone in Native American studies, and Navajo historiography that has helped inaugurate the now thriving field of critical indigenous studies. She's also written two Navajo histories for young adults and authored numerous influential essays that focus on the politics of Diné nation building, indigenous and Diné feminisms, indigenous gender and sexuality, and settler colonialism and decolonization. The special issue of Wakazo Shaw Review on native feminisms that she co-edited with Mashana Goman was a decisive contribution to centering Native feminist research and writing. As a member of the Navajo Nation Human Rights Commission since 2011 and commission chair from 2016 to 2020, 
Dennett Dale worked to advance civil and human rights, especially in the areas of employment, housing, sacred sites, predatory lending, sexual violence, and gender discrimination. At the Navajo Nation Human Rights Commission, she has sought to implement the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples as a means to address the longstanding human, Navajo human rights violations under United States colonialism and in pursuit of justice for the Navajo people. She initiated the NNHRC study on the status of Navajo women and gender, uh, gender violence, conversations with the Dene traditional medicine people and a dialogue with the people, which among other initiatives led to the NNHRC hosting two days of inquiry into the murder of uh, Laurel Tijani, a Navajo woman who was murdered by a police officer in Winslow, Arizona in 2017. At the NNHRC, she has also initiated inquiries into predatory lending and the inflated costs for funerary services that have targeted the most vulnerable and economically precarious among the Navajo Dene community. Dr. Dene Dell's community and policy work has been consistently developed in connection with scholarly publication and far reaching critical inquiry. Most recently with the just published book, Red Nation Rising, from Border Town Violence to Navajo Liberation, which she co-authored with Nick Estes, Melanie Yazi, and David Correa. As if the extraordinary and scope and engagement of these accomplishments were not enough, she's also served as a guest curator for the Navajo Nation Museum and worked with the National Museum of the American Indian in Washington, DC. At UNM, she and Sam Truitt led the way with the university's membership and graduate student and faculty participation in the prestigious Newbury Consortium of American Indian Studies at the Newbury Library in Chicago. Dr. Dennett Dale has been recognized for her scholarship and community advocacy with many awards, including the Dene Pride Sacredness Before Stonewall Award bestowed by Dene Equality, the Excellence in Dene Studies Award by the Dene Studies Conference, the Rainbow Natsalid Program's True Colors Award, UNM's Faculty of Color Award for her teaching, research, and service in the academy, and the UNM Sarah Brown Bell Award for Community Service. In 2017, she was awarded the UNM Presidential Award of Distinction. I can think of no one more deserving of the honor bestowed by the Community Engaged Lectureship Award. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming Professor Dennett Dell. Okay. She Jennifer Dennett Dell and she a Logan Shlow, a Shingle Bashes Jean, Kilichini Dashache, Tore Head Cleaning Gashinana, but our area, the Ned Stan Schle. I want to thank UNM's Community Engaged Lectureship Award Committee for this honor of representing our university community, and to my co conspirator, Dr. Alyosha Goldstein, for his friendship and his support. Um, for this nom for nominating me for this award and for his just wonderful um, introduction. Uh, I am pleased with the, yesterday was a very busy day. I had the most visitors that I've had in a year. Um, the award committee brought by the flowers that you see in my background. They brought by this beautiful plaque. And then they also brought, had a cake also delivered. So I don't have a picture of that cake. So I just want to, to thank the, the award committee um, for these wonderful gifts. Uh, I also am pleased to be faculty in American studies. It is a place where I can research, write and teach to my heart's content. I have many things to be grateful for. And I do a shout out which Dr. Alyosha, Dr. Goldstein mentioned. Uh, I, have to, I wanna do a shout out for this collectively written book to be released in early May. And I just picked up my copy today. Um, my colleagues, Melanie K. Yazi, Nick Estes and David Correa, uh, all from American Studies and Native Studies. We collaborated on this book and I'm just, I'm really pleased to have gotten my copy today. I also want to hold up our indigenous academic community. I'm appreciative of the place we hold as indigenous faculty, graduate students, and undergrads on this campus. And I thank you for your kinship. I also want to acknowledge the peoples of this land, the Kisani, our Pueblo relatives on whose land we reside and acknowledge them um, at, for, their, 
for their um, for their presence uh, on their land. Uh, thank you. I next would like to acknowledge my intentions that my scholarship be community engaged and how at least 40 years ago, I became inspired by the stories my mother began to tell me of my great, 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 great grandparents, Asant Loge and Haskinch and Hajina, who stood on the front lines against American war, the American war against our Dine in the summer of 1863. Thank you, my ancestors. Your stories inspired me to follow this path of research and writing with the intent of holding up Dine and indigenous peoples. And I hope you find me an adequate granddaughter. And I just want to share this picture of my ancestors who yesterday um, I was thinking about writing and not considering myself to be a writer as I'm planning some more projects. <laughs> and I thank my, my ancestors because they continue to inspire me to do this work. So I would like to begin uh, my presentation. I am not necessarily following uh, my my slide my present my slides here, but I just want to show you some images as they go along with my um, this work that I'm presenting to you this evening. Um, this work on COVID-19 on the Navajo Nation and border towns um, was written over the course of three and a half months, and I submitted it as an essay. Just um, a little more than uh, three weeks ago uh, for publication to an anthology. So what you're reading, what I'm sharing with you is a, a section or a portion of this essay that I, um, I, I just sent in. On March 17, 2020, international attention turned to the Navajo Nation in the Southwestern United States as Navajo reporter Arlissa Pacenti relayed confirmation that a 46-year-old Navajo man had tested positive for COVID-19. The Diné had a travel history and was from Chichil, Arizona, a community that would be highlighted in national and international news as a virus hotspot when it was revealed that Navajos had attended a Nazarene zone rally at the Chichil church and then returned to their nearby communities of Cameron, Coppermine, Kaibato, Lachi, Tonalia Red Lake and Navajo Mountain. Two Diné died, one confirmed to have attended a rally and both had respiratory symptoms associated with the novel coronavirus. As we now know, the coronavirus disease 2019 caused by severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2 was first identified in December 2019 in Wuhan, the, the capital city of Quebec province, China. By December 12, 2020, the World Health Organization declared the virus an epidemic of worldwide concern. By June 1, 2020, the Navajo Nation reported 5,250 positive cases, 1,745 recoveries, and 241 deaths. On February 13, 2021, the Navajo Department of Health website reported that 29,098 Navajos had been tested and 1,097 had died from COVID. After six months with a lull in the rates of infections and deaths, we experienced another round of the virus spread. Navajo Nation President Jonathan Nez ordered weekend lockdowns and weekday curfews multiple times. Okay, so I just wanted to share a map um, of the Navajo Nation, the red part there, um, just to give you a, a sense of uh, where the Navajo Nation, the, the size of the Navajo Nation. Um, and then we received, we, would, we still receive um, daily updates by the Navajo Nation Department of Health. And this is, was posted on 11, uh, September 11th, 2020. And you get a sense of um, the number of cases. From, from these daily updates. The virus for which in the last months vaccines have been developed has become the source for political division and a weapon for white supremacy to destroy the US economy and re-entrench disparities that are now blaring manifest as communities of color are drastically affected and they suffer the highest infection and death rates. Navajo country was hit hard by COVID and national media rushed to document the arrival of the pandemic. Sunny Dooley, 
a storyteller and keeper of traditions shared about the conditions on the southern side of our homeland. She wrote, my Hoan has electricity, but no running water. My brothers bring me water and they put it in a 75 gallon barrel. I drink that water and I wash with it, but I also buy five gallons of water for $5 in case I need extra. I typically use a gallon a day for everything, cooking, drinking, and washing up. Julie relates what we should better call the conditions of death. She says, we have a lot of cancers in our community, perhaps because of the uranium. And we have many other health issues that makes the virus so, viral, so viable among us. We have a lot of diabetes because we do not eat well and a lot of heart disease. We have alcoholism. We have high rates of suicide. We have every social ill you can think of. And COVID has made these vulnerabilities more apparent. I look at it as the monster that is feeding on us because we have built the perfect human for it to invade. Dooley's story, stories reflect the historical and colonial conditions that make possible the monster feasting on us, specifically the social health and economic disparities, open the spaces for Dook Osin Tsai 19 to spread rapidly through Navajo communities. The Diné word Dook Osin Tsai 19 translates as the big cough and it recalls earlier exposures that Navajos had to diseases um, from the mid 19th century and into the early 20th century. And our reference to this, uh, to COVID-19 as a monster invokes our creation stories in which our, our, monster, our ancestors faced monsters and ultimately overcame many of the monsters. These stories of how we overcome and persevere are the stories we tell as we, pay, as we face Dokosin Tsai. Dene journalist Sonny Klaus Jilly made similar observations in her travels across the homeland as she interviewed our relatives experiencing the traumas of the disease. As she noted, there is no safe haven today on the Navajo Nation where generations of families have lacked running water, food, electricity, indoor plumbing, safe housing, and access to health care, the basic necessities for fighting disease. Diné are matrilineal, meaning that we continue to organize households, often extended and generational, and therefore hold many responsibilities that put us as women more at risk. Navajo women are caretakers of the many people around them who've tested positive for the virus. They care for, they care for sick family members, do the relief work to bring supplies to community members, and sew masks. Um, Sunny also, Flashy Shitty also notes that women are also carrying caskets at burial sites, typically a man's job. According, <clears throat> excuse me, according to the United Nations, COVID-19 disproportionately harms women and, and girls simply by virtue of our sex. Women are even more vulnerable to the virus as a result of poor health care, poverty, trauma, and high rates of illnesses like, like diabetes. Women are likely to be more exposed to the virus because they are frontline workers, uh, such as nurses and healthcare staff. For example, in the first two months of the virus's appearance in Gallup, a Navajo nurse's aide told me about, about her exposure as a first responder who spent hours in patients' rooms. The stories of Navajo women like her who attended patients every day while the, the hospital's nurses and doctors and nurses protested and made public their vulnerability. The, Nav the Navajo staff, from the nurse's aides to the clerks to the facilities management, did not have a public audience even though they suffered sustained exposure. Women, Navajo women not only hold many of these jobs in the hospital, hospitals, but they also hold essential jobs, usually low, play, play, low paying ones in grocery stores and retail stores. And because these jobs are in border town spaces, they must travel every day to work, often 40 to 150 miles to get to work. 
I received another call from a concerned relative because the stores in Gallup seemingly were not taking their employees possible exposure to the disease seriously. Klaus Tish Chile's interview with the elder Chile Yazi of, of Shiprock, New Mexico further illustrates the devastation facing our communities. Yazi shares, everyone knows someone who has struggled with COVID-19 or died from it. Each day brings a new round of worry, grief, and fear. Yazi says for him, it's been a time of reflection, of trying to understand what is happening. He says, the world is in great disorder. The equilibrium of the earth is greatly upset. And perhaps the pandemic is the great disciplined whip of the earth from having irre irretrievably damaged the earth. This is a virus to be reckoned with. It is alive with death. I take these thoughts from Dooley and Yazi that Plus, just Chile um, also uh, shared to think through US, the US's historical treatment of its indigenous people, the systematic theft of indigenous lands and natural resources, and the genocidal policies that are still in place to eliminate us as indigenous people. For it is this history that created the conditions of life for the monster to, feed up, to feast upon us. These historical conditions shaped the net life and facilitate the appearance of the monster, the Kosinta 19, to feast on the Navajo body today. And here's a, a picture from the um, national news media of one of the first places um, where they traced uh, the virus um, to, to appear and spread. This is on the Northern side of um, the Navajo nation. Navajo experiences with pandemics and epidemics such as the influenza and tuberculosis, for example, invites a historical view on indigenous people's experiences with diseases that devastated communities. According to Nick Estes, indigenous deaths from old world diseases wiped out indigenous populations in the Americas from 100 million to 10 million. He writes, there is a common myth in US history that most indigenous people did not die because of active killing. Warfare and genocide, but rather as a result of outbreaks, smallpox, measles, and cholera. However, these epidemics occurred and intensified in times of war, which meant mass starvation, deprivation of resources, such as access to sanitary conditions, water, food, shelter, or the dependence on rations as a means of survival. So indigenous peoples are familiar with bioterrorism as it relates to infectious disease. As so many of our people relate, the conditions that make the virus alive with death are the structures of settler colonial practices. What Achille Membi terms a sovereign's right to dictate who may live and who may die. Eliminating indigenous people takes new forms. Once outright wars are no longer, once outright wars on indigenous people are no longer considered quite, are no longer quite civil. As Patrick Wolf declares, the logic of elimination not only refers to the summary liquidation of indigenous people, but settler nation practices to provide the means necessary to prosper, including decent living conditions and access to health care. Historically, the net introduction to infectious diseases began at the Bosque Redonda concentration camp from 1863 to 1868. At the turn of the 20th century, Navajos battled the influenza of 1918, which left 2,000 Diné fatalities, approximately one-tenth of the Diné population. The influenza pandemic killed 50 million people worldwide with indigenous people suffering mortality rates four times that of the wider population. Smallpox spread among in school children and trachoma infections for at least two decades. And these outbreaks revealed the inadequacies of a health system, healthcare system that the federal government provided. The government's response to the pandemic and epidemics that struck Navajos did not improve healthcare. And as Robert Trenard found, 
the devastation of the flu failed to produce any significant improvement in health care for the Navajo. A, a history of health care then reveals the roots of failed, failed, failed federal government response to the pandemic that is now unleashed on Navajo communities. The grounds for war against indigenous people has shifted from outright war to the places where laws, governance, policies, and practices are the sources to limit, eliminate us as indigenous peoples. Public health officials, indigenous leaders, and scholars immediately recognized that the virus's rapid spread into our communities where inequalities, poverty, and disparities are the conditions of life are also the conditions of death, revealing how and why Diné communities were immediate hotspots. National media's attention to the virus is tainted with economic elitism as we participate in or we witness the rebuking of people of color who cannot seem to stay home, who must for survival go to their jobs, who live in crowded housing conditions, and who are now and who now expose their vulnerable bodies for more scrutiny because we live with disparities. Similarly, Navajos were subjected to such criticism and included observations that several generations live in one house or a one room Hawan. The common sense that tradition has played a role in the spread of the virus into Navajo land is further evidenced by interviews with Navajos who allow images of their home to accompany the stories written and circulated. Ironically, homes are often dilapidated and several generations live under one roof, not because it is traditional, because, but because it is almost impossible for Navajos to build a home on Navajo, on Navajo land. A proposition made difficult for a number of reasons, including high unemployment, poverty, and antiquated Navajo, Navajo Nation land use laws and policies. Um, and here's, I have an image here of one of two hospitals in Gallup um, that was, um, were, were um, taking in uh, COVID, state, uh, COVID patients right at the beginning of, in um, March of, of, the end of February and March um, of last year. And I don't cover this in this presentation um, this evening, but I do in, in the larger essay look at, um, how the virus also spread in border towns, particularly among our un unsheltered and how they were allowed, once they'd been diagnosed with COVID, allowed to leave the hospital and move throughout um, the towns like Gallup. And so uh, Rehoboth Christians was one of the hospitals where um, COVID patients were taken um, as well. Also exacerbating the spread of the coronavirus through Navajo communities, the Navajo Nation's poor infrastructure is reflected in high unemployment, few businesses, and only 13 full service grocery stores. A food desert across more than 27,000 square miles, a land base that is often compared to the state of West Virginia. A poor infrastructure makes it necessary for constant travel to border towns and cities for even the most basic of necessities. It was in the middle of March, 2020, when we began to hear about the virus and the advice to sanitize your spaces and wash your hands. My family and I were caring for our mom as she bravely battled cancer in my home. She listened as we talked about public health concerns, the hoarding of toilet paper and sanitizing products and storing extra food. Mom suggested we buy canned foods, canned goods, and powdered milk, marking her familiarity with stark years, for she was born in 1934, a, ta a time that many know as the Depression era. But for Diné, it was also an era of the livestock reduction under U.S. Indian Commissioner John Collier, who ordered the removal of 50% of Navajo-owned horses, sheep, and goats as a response to decades of federal officials' concerns that Navajos had overgrazed the land with too many animals. The post-livestock reduction era after 1937 and into the 1950s led to a massive engineering of Navajo life that is relevant to understanding how and why the, uh, the virus took its toll on us. Um, these are, this is a picture of my mom and my dad. 
my parents were the last generation of Diné integrated into a livestock economy where sheep, goats, and horses were life in Sheep is life meant that life revolved around a, a land tenure system based upon keh, a complex and sophisticated code of ethics, which stipulated how one cared for one's relatives, one's livestock, the land, and how to relate to each other and the universe. Life based upon the movement of sheep and goats meant movement to grazing lands and watering places seasonally. What indigenous scholars like Melanie K. Yazi name as relationality, a kinship, and then a relationship with other humans, with sheep and the land itself. Kinship that shapes how extended family and political units share space and approach mutual land use practices. The livestock reduction era, approximately the late 1930s and into the 1940s, is stark in the Diné collective memory because in Collier's attack on our domestic animals was an attack on our way our, of life. And our dependence on livestock was a measure of self-sufficiency that many of our people had regained after the return to the homeland in 1868. Commissioner of Indian Affairs, John Collier's determination to rehabilitate Navajo land was spurred by decades of federal reports warning that drought conditions and Navajo livestock had denuded the land. Federal concern was also driven by fear that silt from, from Navajo land might clog the reservoir near Hoover Dam. Even though the Navajo Nation holds impressive water rights under the Winters Doctrine, at least 40% of, of Navajo households do not have running water. Rather, our natural resources like water, coal, gas, and oil and the vast open spaces of unpolluted air have been hijacked to feed the monster of capitalism. And I just share some photographs with you from Milton Snow, which are from the uh, post livestock re uh, reduction era. Snow's photographs were used um, as evidence of how deteriorated the environment and the land was on Navajo land. Um, providing the excuse for uh, the reduction of our life of our livestock. And so, and then I'm just sharing some quotes with you uh, because there was a number of um, scholars, particularly anthropologists, um, who worked with um, white other white reformers and with uh, federal um, agencies to determine how to um, uh, have Navajos become, um, self-sufficient again. And so there was all these questions about how to um, rehabilitate not just the land, but to rehabilitate the Navajo people as well. And so these are just some of the things that I'm sharing with you in terms of um, this, this period. The devastation of a subsistence system led to an, engineer, re, in, an engineering of Navajo life from efforts to restore the land to a transformation of governance, health, education, domestic and intimate spaces with the intentions of recreating Navajos as ideal citizens of not only their own nation, but of the US as well. As Melanie K. Yazi points out, such engineering by the federal government and white reformers intended to remake Navajo Diné into nuclear family units, the building block of capitalism. Development then meant an integra integration into the structures of the US as a natural progress of social development. However, as Yazi notes, development is not a natural process, but rather a form of politics that stakes a claim within a field of power conditioned by the inequalities and, and violence of prevailing structures of global capitalism, US imperialism and colonialism. Diné scholars offer incisive analysis of how and why the Navajo nation is rendered a third world country where Diné Pequeya is mined for natural resources to benefit settler towns and, in, and cities, in fact, creating them. It is this network of relationships to Sutter colonial institutions that leads to the conditions of life or more accurately conditions of death for Diné in the present. 
the devastation of the Navajo subsistence system engineered by federal officials colluded with corporations who raped the land for its resources in order to create the urban Southwest and paved the course of the monster COVID to feed insidiously on our bodies. John Collier's post-livestock reduction to transform life, Navajo life, is his legacy to the Navajo people. It led to a wage economy, the migration of our people across the imaginary boundaries of the Navajo Nation and US border towns and cities in search of wage work and the constant search for basic supplies of food, clothing, gasoline, shelter materials, and grain for livestock for survival. Collier's legacy includes the numbers of our people living in the streets of these towns and cities as well. Spaces beyond the boundaries of designated Navajo lands became border towns where settlers enriched themselves through the Indian trade. In the present moment, border towns remain violent spaces for indigenous people and facilitate the spread of the virus to the Navajo nation. And these are just some of the uh, photographs from this period and not, you know, in, in a work that I'm, a uh, book manuscript I'm working on um, using these photographs by Milton Snow. Um, you can see how this uh, Collier's rehabilitation program for Navajo people really meant a transformation of Navajo people into the forms of life um, under a modern democracy um, that really, and this is a, a photograph of students students who are meeting the bus um, to be taken to um, Sturt Indian School in Sturt, Nevada. My mom and dad went to boarding school. Uh, they met at um, Carson Indian School. Uh, so this is all from that era. And, you know, there was such a huge migration of um, Navajo people into the wage economy once um, the livestock economy had been destroyed. And so my father um, worked for over 25 years for El Paso Natural Gas Company to take care, to sustain his family um, of seven. Oops, something happened. Okay, so a year later, we assess the devastation. Navajo Nation Council Delegate Amber Crotty shares with the Guardian. She says, everyone has been impacted. Some families have been decimated. How can we go back to normal when we've lost so many after so many layers of trauma? It's unbearable. Former Navajo Nation President and Arizona State Representative Albert Hale died from the virus on February 2nd, 2021, bringing the Navajo Nation's death toll to 1,038, the equivalent of losing one in every 160 people on our nation. And my sister also, uh, my family in Tohatchi would share stories um, of um, news of our relatives um, who had passed away from COVID. My sister sent me pictures um, from her camera phone of the, it's about 20 miles from Tohatchi to Gallup. And all along the way, like in, in four different places, you would see signs from Navajo family saying, we're taking donations for funerals um, at this home here. And then you had other, um, you had other uh, signs along the way throughout the Navajo nation where Navajo families were saying, just don't come um, to our place, okay? Uh, we're not receiving visitors right now. And then the um, Hatrahis, the medicine people, um, also were not taking, um, receiving patients, uh, people who were requesting messages. And some of them had devised box, put boxes uh, uh, by their front door with paper and a pencil, pen, and a note on there saying, you know, um, put your prayers requests and whatever you're offering for your prayers in the box, and I will do the prayers for you. Um, so um, at the moment that the US is hopeful of a return to more normal life, even in the face of a collapsing economy, 
strains on the healthcare system and US security agencies seeking out the rioters who attacked the Capitol. We are reminded of Black Lives Matter's protest against police violence and calls to end racism, police violence, and poverty and all manners of inequality. Their, their activism resonates with indigenous communities who stand with their black brothers and sisters in solidarity and call for indigenous liberation. Ironically, the federal government and state leaders rushed to confront protests, calling up state and city law enforcement and the National Guard spending many millions while they lagged at controlling the coronavirus. As Kanega Yamanta Taylor declares, if we are serious about ending racism and fundamentally changing the United States, we must begin with a real and serious assessment of the problems. We diminish the task by continuing to call upon the agents and actors who fuel the crisis when they had opportunities to solve it. She offers, we have the resources to remake the United States, but it will have to come at the expense of the plutocrats, um, plutocrats and plunderers. And therein lies a 300 year old conundrum. America's professed values of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness continually undone by the reality of debt, despair, and the human degradation of racism and inequality. As the pandemic rips through our community, leaving us devastated, Danette poet Jake Skeets asked us, what, what are we grieving? And why might we long for a time before the virus when the reality is our people were already suffering greatly under the American capitalistic system? He states, every month there were numerous headlines announcing the deaths that occur in border towns around, reserva around the reservation. So if we yearn for the time before this year, this virus, are we also yearning for those ills as well? Or do we yearn for the post pandemic, which will include either further disaster capitalism or the so-called end times, both of which would be catastrophic for families in the United States? Skeet's query goes to the heart of how Diné have returned to their stories, stories that affirm that our relationships stories that affirm our relationship to the land and that stories that tell us how we relate it to each other through, eh, through kinship. The counter to the devastation to death is in the life and its persistence through relationships that extend to the natural world and all beings. Through our relationships, we will revitalize our communities. Our relatives are sharing their stories. They are revising baby's first laugh, celebrations by dropping off salt and goodies to family and friends instead of hosting a gathering at home. Grandmothers are monitoring their grandchildren in virtual classes. And sometimes they are having to drive their vehicles to places where the internet is, is available and sit in the vehicle with their, while their grandchildren do their work, their schoolwork. We are planning how to continue celebrate. We are planning how we are planning how to continue the ceremony that celebrates girl, a girl who has become a young woman, the Kinalda. And I receive a text from one of our Tkathi, our seniors, who conducts the passage for boys becoming young men, and he informs me that he will be conducting that ceremony. Of course, all of us assure each other that we are being careful and we are all fully vaccinated. Indigenous people's dreams of freedom do not lie in the possibilities that the center state will ever transform. Rather, its structures of colonialism are embedded in capitalism and will always be violent and anti-Indigenous because it is required for its very survival. Rather than accommodating the settler state, which requires indigenous recognition within its, within its colonial structures, oppressed communities benefit by collectively building power through communities and building relationships based upon kinship. Kinship that goes beyond the, the limits of human to human, but relations to all living areas, to all living things. 
we have always turned to the strength of our ancestors and we do so now. And here I quote Audra Simpson, we cannot carry out the kind of decolonization our ancestors set in motion if we don't create a generation of land-based community based intellectuals and cultural producers who are accountable to our nations and whose life work is concerned with the regeneration of these systems. Their voices, their voices carry the wisdom of my ancestors. We come from a long tradition of resistance. It is not new knowledge to me. For my late father was a heater who, pra who prayed for our relatives every day. Um, and then, you know, looking back a year, you have many people looking at um, what's changed, what are some of the conversations that are happening um, a year later in the Navajo Nation. Uh, I understand from uh, just reading through media uh, that the Navajo Nation is looking to appropriating um, funding and another round of uh, CARES Act funding um, for running water and electricity and providing broadband access. Um, also looking into affordable housing um, on, on the Navajo Nation. On, um, let's see, I can't see this. Okay. The, on March 23rd, 2021, the Navajo Nation on Monday reported zero new coronavirus cases or deaths in the previous 24 hours for the first time this year. Um, the death toll, the, there's, the death toll remains at 1,233 since the big pandemic began with the number of confirmed cases at 30,010 um, on, the, on the Navajo land that covers Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah. And the Navajo Nation has begun opening up some businesses with a 25% capacity. Um, and then the mask mandates and daily curfews remain. Um, so that's the, um, that covers the presentation um, that I want to share, the work that I want to share with you. Uh, I was talking to uh, graduate students yesterday and we had one question or one concern from one of our UNM graduate students who said that it seems to her as a Diné scholar that the work we do in the academy um, and the language um, that we speak as academics and the research that we have to follow, the books that we have to read as, uh, as intellectuals often do not um, fit or do not seem to be concerned with um, the communities that we say we serve. And I was part of the conversation and I said that as a scholar who cares about my indigenous nations and my communities, that my questions come from my communities um, and I bring them into my space as an academic, um, create the questions based upon the concerns of my nation and my community, um, and then make the questions, the research questions and take it back um, to my relatives. And so um, I have been, I just wanted to say quickly that I have uh, several, uh, community engaged research projects that I'm working on. Um, one of them is related to um, what we see that's happening right now with um, the devastation of the, of the pandemic. And one of the things that we've been concerned with the Navajo leaders and, and me as a commissioner on the Navajo Nation Human Rights Commission is the funeral service practices and the care of um, our relatives' bodies. This has been an ongoing concern. And so with the support of, with the work on, did on the Navajo Nation Human Rights Commission, we produced a, um, a Navajo funerary studies report. And if you go to our website, the Navajo Nation Human Rights Commission um, website, you will see um, the report that we, with that we um, um, produce. That report, uh, not since the 1970s, has there been any kind of gathering of a report um, Nav about Navajo deaths and Navajo funeral services. And one of the reasons why we're interested in that issue um, is also because the, the practice of preparing and taking care of our relatives' bodies once they have um, left their bodies and gone to, on to their next journey is that this is part of um, border town businesses that 
one of our Navajo leaders said to me, uh, which is really profound in one of our conversations about now about funerary practices, um, what he said to me was that every single Navajo body is subsidized. If it's not subsidized by the Navajo Nation um, through the social service division, then it's been subsidized by the CARES Act and then by the federal government's CARES Act. And that's just, that's just absolutely profound to me. So one of my um, new projects then with, um, with my relatives on the Navajo Nation is to return to kin-based care of bodies when our relatives have journeyed to the next business. Um, this is also a concern for our leaders as they, as they uh, discuss and share about limited land use for burials. Um, we're also concerned about the costs um, because border town businesses um, hold a monopoly on our bodies. The second project, um, which was inspired by my grandson who will be a Lobo in the fall, uh, is a Navajo government textbook. And so I let Navajo, my relatives know, and I already have uh, like 10 Diné who are ready and willing um, to start working on this project. And so those are a couple of projects that I just wanted to mention that are community-based um, projects, uh, collaborative, collaborative projects. Um, and then of course I have my own um, single uh, research items like the book manuscript on the photographs of Milton Snow, who documented Navajo life um, from 1947, 1937 to about 1957. So that's an ongoing project. Um, so I just wanted to share all of that with you. I thank you very much uh, for your time uh, and your interest in my topic. And so I'm, I'm through if the um, moderator wants to take questions. Uh, yes, Dr. Denendale. Um, okay, so we'll move to the question and answer um, session, Tabitha. All right, guys, if you have any questions, um, please um, select the Q&A bo uh, button on the bottom. And um, as soon as you have a question, I'll go ahead and uh, unmute you so you can ask. Okay, looks like Patricia has a question. Let me unmute you, Patricia. Give me just one moment. You should be able to talk now, Patricia. Oh, actually, this is Irene Vasquez. Oh. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I oh. guess I, I borrowed a link from Patricia Covarrubias. <laughs> <laughs> But um, Dr. Denadale, you, you've yes. already addressed um, the, the value of returning um, your scholarship, which is highly influenced by community knowledge and practice uh, to your community. So I was just wondering if you might share a few examples of how you do that. I always, I have an article that I was published in 2006 and it's the chairman, president and princesses, um, the, uh, the Navajo Nation gender and a politics of tradition. And I was, uh, I was early in my PhD program and I was list, I, would, I had a job, a summer job on the Navajo Nation with one of the offices. And I would have lunch with um, the women who were working in the offices as administrators, as clerks, and we would sit together and we would talk. So one day I'm just, we're just bantering and talking. One of them mentions the women um, who work for the council delegates um, as a secretary of pool. And they said something that was very striking to me. Um, and they then moved into talking about sexism and um, gender discrimination and um, Navajo male privilege uh, and you can see that also when every time a Navajo woman um, runs for uh, president of the Navajo Nation, then the questions about, you know, is it traditional for a Navajo woman to hold the highest office in the Navajo Nation? And so those kinds of questions um, 
particularly about that happened in, in what we consider domestic and private spaces, then become the fodder for my research questions. <laughs> and so those questions, um, at the same time that that was happening, um, one of my dear relatives, Red Cody, who's the Neh and Nahisha, um, Navajo and Black, uh, was also facing um, racism from our own people. And so those two came together for me in this, um, by deconstructing um, Navajo, the Navajo Nation. Um, and so I use that as an example of how I began to generate questions at, on the ground in my communities and writing about, about these questions. And so that article is considered um, seminal. Um, it's, it's been published three times, you know, and then just more, more recently, I mentioned that our efforts are we're going to begin working on um, returning the practice uh, uh, around death. We, we want to return it back to our Navajo people. We should be in charge of caring for uh, um, our relatives' bodies once they have left and take that care that we have given, that authority that we've given to border town um, businesses. We need to re reclaim that, you know. So, that's a collaborative project because I can't do this. I can't do this work because we don't talk about death, um, and so it takes a, a person's persons with certain authority um, who has traditional knowledge around death concepts of the afterlife and proper burial practices to begin the conversation. You know, so we're planning some gatherings first with other um, med people with traditional knowledge and then moving out into the community. So, because that practice, um, Western and Christian funeral practices are probably like 97, 99% of what we do now. I mean, it's, it's pretty incredible to me that we've lost um, control over that. And so those are, I think, are two kind of community-based um, engagements that I'm doing right now. And of course, the other one, the, the Navajo government textbook was inspired by my grandson. We're sitting at this table and I'm tutoring him through the Navajo government that he has to take. Um, and the, I'm said to, I said, this textbook is dated. Um, it's too expensive. And I told him, I said, we're going to do another. We're going to write a textbook. And he's like, really, Grandma? And I'm like, that's right. And you're on my committee. <laughs> so I've had Navajo um, elders ask me if they can be um, our advisor and our mentors for that project. So those are just three examples of where my questions come from. They come from everyday dilemmas and issues or concerns that um, people have. I hope that answers your question, Irene. Thank you so much. Sure. All right, looks like we have another question from Dana Bell. So give me just one moment, Dana. So I can find you and unmute you. Okay, you should be unmuted. Are you there, Dana? Hi, uh, it's actually Rich Wood. Dana's my wife. We're both oh. uh, listening to Dr. Dennett Dale together. So uh, really wonderful to hear about your work. Um, I wonder if you you could say a bit about current state of UNM's relations with Navajo Nation. What what is the university or some of its units doing right, and what still feels and is experienced as really colonial? You know, I honestly don't know what UNM's relationship is to the Navajo Nation. Um, I would like to know. Um, I can I can call. Like one of my, I don't know if she'll appreciate me saying this, <laughs> but because, you know, with the, the first book that I published, um, my monograph that was based on my dissertation, The Reclaiming the Net History about my, my great, great, great grandparents, because I had interviewed my, my grandparents my, from my mother's, my, mother, my, my, my grandmother's side were matrilineal people, so I had access to those stories. And I interviewed my, um, my grandparents and the, all of them, ones that I've interviewed have since passed on. And so because I, I appreciated the interviews and the support I got from my extended family for writing this book, I donated the, res, the royalties to the Navajo Nation Scholarship um, Office for the 
um, Chief Manuelito Scholarship, which is a very prestigious um, scholarship. So um, I'm planning to approach the scholarship office and begin to think about, to have a conversation with, with them and other Navajo leaders about how I get the Navajo Nation to endorse um, my Navajo government textbook for high school students and for teachers and that they'll say, this is the book you have to use when you're teaching Navajo studies and you're teaching Navajo government. Okay, so for the most part then, my relationships with, with my understanding um, as someone who works with UNM um, is to do this on an individual basis and to, to talk to different leaders and let them know um, what's going on. Um, so I, that's a, I, you know, I would like to know what the answer is to that question. I do know that the Navajo Nation uh, under the, um, the former president, Russell Begay, ha was subsidizing um, dorms for um, Navajo students on campus and that they have canceled that contract. You know, so it probably would have taken some uh, public relations, some relationships with um, with the Navajo Nation, you know, to have kept that contract for our Navajo students. Um, as a commissioner on the Navajo Nation Human Rights Commission, one of the things that I do note is that it's very, very rare for anyone from border towns or cities to come to the Navajo Nation. It's very rare for a mayor to go into Navajo communities and say, hey, you know, I know that you spend that every um, 70 cents of every Navajo dollar comes into Gallup, New Mexico. And I just want to thank you and say, hey, you know, let's do some things together. You know? um, so that, that's the only way I can answer your question, Rich. Um, I think it, it, I think it's something that um, that should be better. Thank you. All right, and it looks like we have another question from Catherine Turner. Let's see, I don't know. Should be unmuted. Oh, you know what? You're breaking up really badly. Um, there is a question from Dave, Daisy Thomas. Um, and Daisy Thomas says, well, your government textbook also include history. There is a need now for such a textbook in the schools now. And I'm a historian by trade and it definitely will include a history. Um, so I'm, I'm working on that. I've had I've all these Navajo scholars and educators who want to contribute and to write sections of the, are volunteering for sections of the book. So definitely it, it has to include history. Uh, we also got donated uh, from Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz and Debbie Reese, their US indigenous people's history of the United States, um, history for young people donated uh, for our um, contributors and for the Diné Educators Education Institute at Northern Arizona University. Um, that's our first stop in letting and asking Navajo teachers to look at our proposed chapter outlines. Catherine, um, are you able to to use your microphone? No. Okay. Um, I'll go ahead and move on to the next. Um, question. I have one from Devra. Devra, you should be unmuted if you want to go ahead and ask your question. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Danette Dale. That was brilliant and heartbreaking, and you are my hero. And my question is, you know, you mentioned that Diné are not waiting for colonizers to co decolonize, uh, hoping that I paraphrase that correctly. And so my question is, what is the aim if not decolonization, which I take your point, to, to uh, combat the two monsters? Like, how would you frame it? I, I suppose for um, Diné or people on the Navajo Nation, but for those of us also who are not uh, Diné, how, how might we conceptualize fighting the two monsters and framing the, the aim? 
You know, that's that's like a million dollar question, Deborah. Um, I like what some of um, some people are saying, like um, Jake Skeets. Um, some of my uh, indigenous comrades are, you know, asking the question of if we're being nostalgic about the time before COVID, exactly what are we being nostalgic back about? Because the time before COVID um, created conditions for it to ravage um, my people. And so what are we being nostalgic about, you know? And so a year later, a reflection, a reflection on, on how this has devastated our people, it really requires a dismantling um, and it requires a restructuring, uh, particularly of the Navajo Nation. I mean, our water rights are just, we have incredible water rights. And yet we have to wait, like one of my relatives waited 10 years um, to get the water pipe to her house and it's like 60 feet. Okay. Um, those conditions have to change. You know, um, the larger structures um, have to change. And right now at this point, we can't fathom what it means to be anti-capitalist. And I have um, comrades, um, dear colleagues, um, who talk about anti-capitalism, you know? So I'm taken with, with their vision. Um, but I think um, the way I ended my talk, um, there's, a, there's, um, there's a sense of a return to to think, to ceremonies, to prayers, to relationships that have always sustained us, you know? Um, and so that's one place that um, I've been looking at of the, of the um, renewal of those relationships, you know? And often those spaces are illegible, illegible to settler colonialism. Um, the, when I mentioned the post-livestock era in, in Navajo history, that was, re that was intended to transform us um, into the mirror image of um, white society, you know, the nuclear um, unit, the nuclear family unit. Um, we're, extent we're people, matrilineal people, um, who, have a who create relationships based upon our extended clanship, okay? That kind of um, creation of community is more sustainable than a nuclear family unit, you know, that puts um, responsibility on two adults. Um, it just, it, it obviously doesn't make sense, <laughs> but we haven't gotten that, to that point of re -transform, of transforming that. Um, we have a model already um, that we know has worked. I, I don't know if that answers your question, Deborah. Yes, it does. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Let's see, it looks like um, we have another question um, from Susan Sherman. Just one moment. Okay, Susan, you should be unmuted. Hello, uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Dennett Dale. I'm glad I caught most of your presentation. Eventually I had trouble registering, but um, yeah, I just, had a question, uh, what is it that you find most rewarding about doing community engaged research? You know, one of the most wonderful things about community engaged research, one, when I was a graduate student and I began to um, interview my grandparents, um, I'm not a fluent Diné speaker. My parents were Diné, fluent Diné speakers and they spoke our language to each other every single day. But because they were products of boarding schools, they didn't expect their children to speak Navajo. So I understand like a fluent speaker, um, I speak at a conversational level. Uh, and getting to know my grandparents through interviewing them for my, for my book on um, our ancestors um, gave me a relationship with them. And it also began to move me towards um, more fluency in the Navajo language. And so that's just been incredibly rewarding for me. And today, um, my mom, I I'm very fortunate because I, I've 
had my parents for most of my life. My dad passed away when I was 58. He was a healer. My mom passed away last year um, when I was uh, 60, 61. And so um, in, in doing this work, particularly the last work with, I was talking about um, uh, funeral practices and my mom passing away in my home here in, in Albuquerque in, on March 29th. Um, and when my dad passed away, we both, we, all of our family took care of them. We took care of them at home. And I sat with my mom and my dad um, the, the, up to their deaths. I, I said, I'm doing, I'm taking care, I'm, wa I'm on watch um, these last few days. So I was there when they both passed. And so when my dad passed, one of the elders came to our house and my sister's house in Tohatchee where my dad had passed. And I sat outside with him on the, on the porch, on the bench. And he spoke to me in Navajo and he told me Navajo concepts of death and the afterlife. I can't translate or I can't tell you what he told me um, because I, it's a sense um, rather than something that I, I can't, it's not translatable into English because it's, it's part of emotion, it's a part of imagination. Um, and so with, with those happening, with, with, with the passing of my mom and dad and, my, our, and our interest in returning Navajo people to, um, to these practices that our ancestors had done, in that then what's rewarding is being able to listen to the language, being able to listen to um, our traditional, our holders of traditional knowledge tell me again and again what this means, you know, and, and how we do this. And so that's the most rewarding practice um, of doing community engagement. And now I, you know, I, I'm 62 now, and I tell people younger than me who are doing research is that you can't just interview a medicine person, you know, call them on the phone an hour and then write down the interview and then put it in, in a piece of, in your article or your work. Um, it doesn't work that way <laughs> with, with them. You have to sit with them in ceremony. You have to hear their prayers. You have to see how they think um, about issues. Uh, and it's a, it's a long-term years of having a relationship to, to respect what traditional knowledge holders have, you know? And I think that, and this is true for me at the end, not at the end, but I come to a place now where it's not important for me to write this down. It's not important for me to translate it into English and publish it. Um, it's important for me to, to understand what they're saying and appreciate it um, in our own Diné way and encourage our own coming, the next generations to do the same time, to take the time and the patience to just sit in ceremony and prayer um, and listen to these stories over and over and over. You know? And so that's the reward. Um, that's what I've come to um, at age 62. <laughs> I, I think about retirement and then I think, oh, I, I got my um, sewing machine cleaned up because I think I'm going to sew. And then I want to, I'm a lousy gardener, but I still bought some more plants. And then I have all these writing projects and I'm like, I should just give up and just acknowledge that um, I need to do these writing projects. <laughs> Somebody has to do them. <laughs> so thank you to everybody. Um, it looks like we have time for maybe one more question. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, or Pamela mentioned earlier, um, if you didn't get a chance to ask your question this evening, um, please send it to OBPR um, at unm.edu and we'll get that answered for you. Um, it looks like um, Catherine Turner, um, she, she wrote, uh, when and where will your new book be available to purchase? You mean which book? Is, the one that I showed here is a, a, a collaboration with um, Nick Estes, Melody Diazzi, me, and David Correa. They're all my colleagues in American studies. And Melanie um, is also in Native studies. But this is called Red Nation Rising from Border Town Violence to Native Liberation. And so we met this morning and we're planning our, um, our book launches uh, in different places. So I know it's going to be available. It's uh, it's PM Press, PM Press, 
And so you can get this book from, um, from PM and Press. Um, yesterday, I was working on a, a book proposal. My, most of my work is in, um, S, is in peer-reviewed journals and um, book, as book chapters. And so I talked to an editor yesterday about putting together a collection of my writings. Um, so it's in one place, particularly because Navajo people don't have access to journals. Um, and we, we live in it, we don't only, not only live in a food desert, we also live in a book desert. <laughs> and so I'm hoping that a collect, uh, uh, putting my works together in one volume will give um, access to Navajo people as well. So I'm working on, on that. Most of it will be um, republished um, articles, um, but there'll be, I think, one or two new pieces in that, in that one. Thank you again, Dr. Dinitdell. Um, I think I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Fisher. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much, Professor Donna Dale, for just such a captivating lecture. And, and I really also enjoyed your responses to the uh, qu questions and answers. That was a, I really enjoyed that. Uh, I'm Ellen Fisher. I'm the Vice President for Research at the University of New Mexico and Professor of Chemistry. Uh, and again, I just want to say I really appreciated how you so eloquently articulated the devastating impact of COVID-19 pandemic on the Navajo Nation. And I was especially moved by the loss of control over um, the death and burial practices, especially in the face of such an overwhelming losses. Um, COVID-19 has challenged us in ways we never thought possible and has also highlighted existing and underlying difficulties um, that again, I think that some of your work has brought to light. Um, working to alleviate disparities while addressing these difficulties should be a continuing priority long after the pandemic has ended. Um, with that, I'd also like to um, offer a special thanks to the members of the UNM Faculty Senate's Research Policy Committee who kindly offered their time this year to uh, select this year's awardee. And I also wanna recognize the OVPR staff who worked very hard at putting this event together. Um, I would now like to invite Professor Dennett Dale to hold up the award in recognition of her extraordinary work and meaningful contributions. There you go. It's beautiful. Um, meaningful contributions to the relationship of UNM and the community at large. She epitomizes the ideals of community engaged research within the academy and serves as a role model for all of us. Um, I would like to personally thank you, Dr. Dennett Dale, for your efforts in advancing research and community engagement at UNM. And thank you. It's been an honor. It's an honor. I'm, I'm honored with this award. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, finally, I'd like to thank everyone for attending tonight's lecture and joining us in, in honoring the achievements of Professor Dennett Dale. Thank you.